Sometimes I do know what's going to raise a big issue. Other times these debates totally blindside me. And we entered into a debate, you and I pitted against each other for a change today, in the world of social media at least, that I had no idea was coming. I am going to try and talk you over to my side tonight, but we'll see. We are jam-packed. High atop Columbia, South Carolina. Look, you see that? We're at South Carolina tonight, and we've been here all day. We're going to have Shane Beamer on the show one-on-one -on -one later. We went probably, I'd say, a good 40 minutes with him today. There is some South Carolina talk. There's a lot of holistic college football talk. Uh, just a lot of stuff that I think will interest a lot of people. So we'll have that on the back half of the show. America's Conference. America's College Football Conference. I want you to think about it for a second. Not just what's in your backyard. What represents America's College Football Conference? That was the source of the disagreement today between you and I. So I'm going to talk about that tonight. Best defenses in the country, as best we can tell, in the middle of spring, before the spring portal window opens up. I have got the Texas Mood Tractor on the show tonight. And as I said, we're going to talk to Shane Beamer one-on-one. -on -one. They're watching us in Andover, Kansas. Atlanta, Georgia's tuned in. Greenville, South Carolina, St. Paul, Minnesota. A lot of good behind the scenes today here at South Carolina. Got in the weight room, toured the entire facility. Um, saw the cockaboos, candidly, one of the highlights of my trip. A lot of it's on the social channels. It's not that we don't have time to show you on here. It's just that... I don't think I want to waste time showing you random pictures of me sitting on a caboose when we have so much to talk about on the show. Follow on the social channels, at Late Kick Josh, especially that Instagram feed. This time of year is very active. You know what I have here as we open the show tonight. If you're listening on podcast, I have a Pac-12 championship game notebook. Rest in peace. That I found in my book bag, and that's what I use to uh, keep my notes today. So Pac-12 Pate still lives in some shape, form, or fashion. All right, um, I kind of buried the lead because what I want to lead the show tonight with is our friends at FanDuel took it upon themselves to release odds not just to make the playoff, but to miss the playoff. And it's 12 teams, as you well know this year, much to my chagrin. And so I was looking over these things earlier, and I had Jesse send me an entire list and I noticed some things that stood out to me. So these are all available. You can bet these right now if it is legal in your jurisdiction at FanDuel. The SEC and the Big Ten have eight of the top nine odds teams to make the playoff. Now, you might think to yourself, well, yeah, that makes sense. That's where a majority of the weight in college football is. That's true. Let me remind you. That's not the way the playoff is structured, at least this year. Yes, you will probably have plenty of SEC and Big Ten flavor, but also... The Big 12's got to make that thing. The ACC's got to make that thing. The G5 has got to make it. And as you'll hear in a second, there's probably a lot of value. If you think you have the Big 12 or the ACC handicap, there's not a single team with minus odds to make the playoff. This is not to win the title, guys. This is just to make the playoff. So Michigan's the first thing that stood out to me. Michigan is pretty much even money, make or miss. It's minus 110 juice either way right now. And if you don't care about betting or never bet, that just means our buddies at FanDuel think they've got just as good a shot to make it as they do to miss it. In a 12-team field, I think we need to keep hammering that home for at least a few more months. So they play Texas this year in week two, I believe it is. May very well find us up there on the yet-to-be-named tour this fall. They play Oregon this year conference game. Go figure. They play Ohio State, obviously. The reason I mention those is those are three of the top five teams in the odds to make the college football playoff this year. Uh, quarterback, new. Staff, whole lot of new. Head coach, new. Also, they just combined to send 18 guys to the NFL Combine. So, yes, there's a lot of newness there. We're going to talk about their defense a little bit later. It is very possible that they could lose three games and make the playoff. It's very possible someone in the SEC or the Big Ten could do that this year. Is it Michigan? Uh, if you think yes, there you go, minus 110. I also noticed Bama, I think maybe, there's no maybe. They are definitely going to be downgraded because of the Saban exit, and there's a lot of new at Alabama for the first time in a little while. I guess what we have to figure out amongst ourselves is, is the Saban downgrade being overly weighted a little bit in the odds market. You're not used to seeing that, whether it's the Cowboys in the NFL or your Alabamas, Ohio States, et cetera, in the college game. Normally, it's the other way. Normally, you're going to have to pay a premium to be betting yes or be betting over or laying or taking the points with them. Well, now you look at Alabama, they got the 10th best odds to make the playoff. They play four teams with an over-under win total of 9.5 or higher. 
that's life in the SEC. That's nothing new. Um, yeah, they go to Oklahoma before they play the Iron Bowl. That's new. But they're going to have a tough schedule. Uh, you've got a returning quarterback, but you've got an entire new offensive system that he's in. But here's the thing I'm thinking about. So let's take those four games they play against teams that figure to be in the nine and a half or better win total range. What if they split them? What if they split them? What if they go 10 and two? What if they don't even go to the SEC championship game? Let's just say Alabama uh, loses a couple of games to really good teams. One of them ends up, you know, playing the other in the SEC championship game. And let's say Alabama is just a 10 and two team. Uh, I think that team's in the playoff. I think a 10 and two from either of those power two conferences uh, conference championship game or not is probably in the playoffs. So I'm very interested to see Bama that far down that odds board. Um, there's no big 12 on this entire list. There's no big 12 in the top nine. That's what I'm talking about. There's no big 12 team, Kansas state. We were there last week. They've got plus two ninety odds. Keep in mind, at least one of these teams is going to make it from that conference. Utah is at plus three ten. Arizona is at plus six fifty. I got some things to say about the Big 12 later. I am very interested that not only in the Big 12 is there no team that's the definitive favorite and is there no team that's minus odds to make the playoff, but that's the same in the ACC. This is really mind-blowing to me because there are two sort of known commodities. There are at least two, and I would argue three, but there are at least two rosters that you would look at and you would say, that's a playoff caliber roster. Uh, Florida State is that. Clemson is that. Now, Miami is that as well this year, but Miami has not gotten close to a playoff spot. So I know, I know my audience because I, I, I interact with you guys a lot on the Miami front. I know you'll have to see it to believe it from Miami. But just for argument's sake for a second, the fact that you have those kind of talent rosters over there in the ACC, uh, Florida State's plus 164 to make the playoff. Clemson's plus 172, Miami plus 260. And then, guys, you don't go that far down the cliff before you get to Louisville at plus 360, and then it's NC State at plus 590. So the point there is there's, there's probably a lot of figuring it out on the fly, even from the odds maker's perspective. Like, even from our friends over at FanDuel, they've never done this before. They've never capped or built an odds market of a yes or no, make or miss the playoff with a 12-team field. And not just the fields that big, guys, you also have the parameters in place that are in place. You got the whole 5-7, and that debate raged on for a little while uh, during the winter. So this is all available right now. It's not hypothetical. These sorts of segments used to be hypothetical. It's not hypothetical. You can go get yourself some action on that right now if you want to. Happy to have you guys with us. Got a really good live crowd. I know a lot of people will watch the replay or listen to the replay of this. Uh, what will that be? Wednesday morning, because there's a lot going on in the sporting world. However, you consume the show. Thank you so much. Make sure you are subscribed to the YouTube channel and the podcast feed. Yes, those are two different things. And uh, that's it. That's all it takes to keep the show free. And we really appreciate it because a lot of you do that already. Just check and make sure. Even if you think you have, just check and make sure. So I had one of you ask me about two weeks ago. If you had to predict it now, who are the best defenses in college football this fall? And I meant to put it in that show, and then things came up. And then I told Jesse, kick it to Sunday. Then we didn't do it. And I said, I'll kick it to next week. And so here we are. We have some time. And uh, i got several more directions I want to go with the show tonight. But uh, Colin, if you're listening to me somewhere down there in South Florida, here's your end point for the individual segment. Best defenses in college football this year. Best defenses across the country, regardless of conference. Who's it going to be? I think Ohio State makes a strong case here. Now, I want us to pause for a second, and I want us to think three or four years back. Ryan Day is, at that point, a very new head coach at Ohio State, and he's an offensive-minded guy, and it's going to be an offensive-minded program, and they're going to score, 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 and hopefully get enough stops to win. That was Ohio State football. Whether he would say that publicly or not, that was their MO when he took over. Whomst amongst us would think, three or four years later, you were going to have a team that could win games defensively. They did that last year. And now you look at them, they were number two in points per game last year. They feature the number one returning S&P Plus defense entering 2024. They got nine returning on that side of the ball. And they added Caleb Downs from Alabama. So I don't know how good Will Howard will be. Maybe we'll go up there and find out for ourselves before spring's over. I'm not sure how good he'll be. I, I think they've got world-class talent there. Some of it's unrealized because it hasn't been featured yet. 
Uh, but even if they don't, even if it takes that offense a little while to get its collective legs under it, they could win games defensively. And so it may not be, if there is such a thing, vintage Ryan Day, Ohio State to start off with. It's also a classic recipe for a defense that f- gives its offense time and then all of a sudden you're watching them in November and they look way different than they did in September. That's kind of college football in general. It could be Ohio State this year. Georgia, we're never going to do a segment on this show about best defense, best defenses in college football where we don't at least mention Georgia. Now, I know the pushback here. And we're getting towards preview magazine season. And I know what those preview mags will say. They'll talk about how much attrition there was. As you know, Meemaw used to tell us all the time, did she not? Everybody focuses on who you lost Not enough people talk about who you have. That's true in coaching. That's true in roster management. And they lost production at every level there at Georgia. But the thing about it is they got 24 underclassmen on defense with experience, with some games played under their belt. We were down there last month. And suffice it to say, there is not a lot of freak out and concern about how good they'll be defensively. They're not satisfied, nowhere close to that, and they're worried about depth. Yes, even at Georgia, they worry about depth, as does everyone else in the country, but they feel like they got the horses and stable. I mean, you've got guys like Michael Williams, Hardaway High School, Columbus, Georgia. you got guys like Malachi Starks. At, At those two of three levels of defense, they could be the best players in the country at their position. So again, when you doubt things at Georgia, it is a very first world doubt. It's a very first world problem. I would look up the road at Penn State. Penn State always finds their way into this conversation of best defenses in college football. They lost some secondary pieces. It it would be my focus. My question about Penn State would be how do they replace those pieces in the secondary? Now, they went and got A.J. Harris, formerly of Central High School, just across the river from Columbus, Georgia. They went and got Jalen Kimber, Those guys have to pan out, and uh, that's the kind of phraseology you're using about a lot of college football teams right now. If fill-in-the-blank from the portal works out, then, I don't know, all of your goals are attainable. They should be elite on the edge again this year. And Penn State's identity uh, has been forged on the defensive side as of late. So I don't have much doubt they'll be good. Will they be great? I think a lot of that depends, statistically at least, on how those corners shake out and those DBs shake out. And Michigan... I got chewed out the other day by a lot of our Michigan viewers, kind of rightfully so, because I kind of glossed over how good they could be defensively. They could be really good defensively. And for all the doubt or consternation or concern about what all they lost offensively and coaching staff, man, there's a mainstay there. Like Mason Graham was really good last year, and he's back. Linebacker core, great big green check mark next to them, for me at least. Will Johnson's there. So kind of like we said with Ohio State, if it takes your offense a while, to get its collective footing, you got guys over there. You can win an ugly 16 to 12 game if you need to. It's not the recipe. It's not the blueprint, but they absolutely can do that. So I know it's not a shock, guys. Like, I understand if we're sitting here in spring, yeah, most people know Ohio State, Georgia, Penn State, Michigan are going to have good personnel over there. However, do we not see other teams with good personnel every year flame out on one side of the ball or the other? only to find ourselves asking, how did they squander that much talent? So it's not just a given because you've you've got the ingredients in the kitchen that we're going to have a half-decent meal. Now, it is a given. If you don't have them, your meal is going to suck. And we've been using that metaphor a whole lot lately, and I understand that. We'll get out of the kitchen eventually. But those are the ones I'm looking at. I'd be very interested to read the comment section on that. A couple more things here, and then we will have Shane Beamer on the show for the rest of the show. And I, as we try and do with these things think you're going to hear him go a lot of different directions that will interest you if you're a Minnesota fan or a UL Lafayette fan or South Carolina fan. So stick around for that. I asked the question earlier today in almost a dismissive manner, what do you think is America's college football conference? Now I had a thought in my mind and I thought a lot of you were going to agree with me. It was one of those things where I wanted to reverse engineer agreement into the show. I say it. You give the answer I wanted you to, and voila, that's how a segment's born. Well, I said it, but almost none of you gave the answer that I wanted you to. So I was taken aback. I thought, yeah, maybe I'm just looking at the wrong batch of responses. But I kept scrolling and kept scrolling, and it was a bunch of SEC, and there was a bunch of Big Ten. It was a bunch of AAC, because the conference has American in the name, not what we were trying to do with that exercise, but I appreciate the effort there. 
I have a thought in my mind, and it's not recency bias. It's not because we toured the Midwest last week. I think the Big 12 is America's college football conference, at least this year and maybe for the foreseeable future. Now, stop yelling, be calm, and let me explain what I mean by that. It's not the most talent-rich conference. It's not where the highest paid coaches reside. It's not the biggest venues. It's not the highest TV ratings. That's not what I'm talking about. I didn't ask that. That would be easy. That's just math. I wanted to know, what is America's College Football Conference? To me, America's College Football Conference would most readily represent what the college football public claims they want in college football. Okay, so right now, obviously, there's a lot of complaint about how NIL has tainted the sport. And this is stuff you would hear from fans. This is not necessarily me editorializing, although I agree with a lot of it. The transfer portal, uh, the mercenary-like nature that players have taken on, certain players. A lot of you claim you don't like that. Well, I'm right there with you. So what can we do? We can either complain about it, which we do, or we can go find somewhere where it doesn't exist as much. Well, in my humble opinion, the more you look at the Big 12, the more you realize the least enjoyable parts of college football are the least present in the Big 12. It's not absent that. Like, you still see some headlines in the Big 12 that make you go, ugh. It's just less available up there than it is, and it's more plentiful elsewhere. So, first thing, you guys claim you want competitive balance. You guys claim you don't like the same teams dominating the fan duel odds and dominating the postseason picture. Do me a favor. Try and figure out how to handicap the Big 12 right now. We did this segment last week where we looked at how many teams were reasonably in the tier one odds board in conferences. And in the Big Ten, it's like Ohio State, Oregon, and everyone else. And in the SEC, it's like Georgia, Bama, et cetera. In the Big 12, like half a dozen teams. That Vegas is essentially saying, yeah, if you think you know better than us, have at it. You got Utah joining the conference, by the way. You got Kansas State in there. Kansas could have the best team they've had in years this year. We just came from Iowa State last year where they think that they've made all the moves they need to to make a run this year. Texas Tech under Joey McGuire started like 14 quarterbacks last year. So if they have any health and consistency at that position, they should be in the thick of it. TCU absolutely do a bounce back. It's do or die time for Dave Aranda at Baylor. Oklahoma State just kind of hangs out every year and then swoops in at the end after everyone wrote them off. That is this conference. There is no more Texas. There is no more Oklahoma. And it's not that they won the thing every year, but they were the odds on favorites every year because they had a disproportionate talent roster advantage. No one has that anymore. No one dominates recruiting in the Big 12. Some of them are better at development once they get them on campus. But that's more the spirit of college football, is it not? Which brings me to my next point. The spirit of college football, which as you know, I told you last week, I think is at the core of what makes it attractive for fans, to me is is woven into the DNA of the Big 12 right now. And what I mean by that is I'm not going to sit here like a five-year-old and talk about the purity and the sanctity, although that's kind of how I feel about the sport way down deep in my heart. Because I think that you should maintain some childlike wonder about this thing that you loved when you first saw it as a kid. Still believe in the Easter Bunny for the same reasons. But I think when you look at the competitive balance, you look at the fact that no one's drastically outspending anyone else in the Big 12. The talent rosters are roughly comparable. So many teams are at the head table and the ones who aren't have access to the head table. You don't see a ton of negative NIL type stories there. You don't see a ton, a ton of roster poaching and mercenary type movement of players. You don't see coaches doing that as much. Culture is preached, but also practiced a whole lot more there, I think, right now than any other conference in college football. If you claim you love that, and if you don't, I'm not even talking about you right now, but if you claim you love that, and a lot of you do, how do you... How do you turn a blind eye to the Big 12 right now? And the other thing is, it is insanely enjoyable football because it's so unpredictable every week. And I think, um, again, that competitive balance thing comes into play. If, if you claim you want that, look out there. you got great venues in the Big 12, too. I know a lot of you may not have made your trips out there. Um, long road trips, really long road trips. But it's really interesting because the fans are extremely knowledgeable, and they don't get credit for it. Because, you know, it's not, it's not major. It's not like Ohio State. It's not Oregon. It's not USC. But the fan bases are really knowledgeable. 
Uh, they travel well. The venues are surprisingly hostile, even though capacity for capacity, they don't, you know, go shot for shot with the Big Ten or the SEC, but they're great coaches out there too. Look up and down the coaching roster in the Big 12 right now. And some of those guys have had opportunities to leave that conference. I'm talking multiples, and they've stuck around. Now, I don't know how long we maintain that there, but I also think there's a better than equal shot that we do because I think a lot of head coaches have stayed at their respective outposts in the Big 12 for a reason. They've stayed there because a lot of what I'm talking about does exist there. Uh, as had the head coaching job goes, it's a lot more football. It's a lot more college football, the spirit of, than maybe is reflected in the head coaching job and role of head coach at other places. So I don't know. You like what you like. But as a fan, just as a pure fan, I can't wait to watch the Big 12 this fall and in years to come, too, as long as the sport doesn't turn itself on its ear like it has been known to do lately. One more thing that I wanted to hit on before we welcome in Shane Beamer to the show. And you're going to notice, even though I say welcome in, it's strangely going to be daylight when we talk to him, even though uh, behind me right now it is not so much. We get in and we record those things earlier in the day so that Bradley, the associate and company, have time to chop it up there in Nashville. We don't edit anything out of that stuff uh, unless I slip up. We don't edit anything out. So you get the full wall-to-wall -wall interview. And uh, head coaches love that because that means they're never taken out of context. So... Before we get to that, we've been doing the Mood Tracker series, and we're going to hit Texas tonight. So that's just basically thermometer in the fan base, how they feeling in spring practice. And Texas is like one of the easy ones. Texas, the mood is just, it's time to eat. Like everyone has been asked, you got to have patience. And they kind of had it as much as a Texas fan could have it. They hired Wright, which was the thing that was holding them back. Um, they hired Wright in a sense that they didn't go get the biggest name, although Sark was a big name, uh, but they, they had the right criteria, at least I feel, this time around. It's not a guarantee of anything, but they hit the bullseye a lot closer than they had with the last few hires. Nothing about the infinite resources of Texas can be harnessed and realized if you don't hire the right head coach. It's just like not having the right quarterback. It doesn't matter what the rest of your roster looks like in big games if you don't have the right signal caller. Head coach is just like that, but for an entire program. So they did that. And then it's time to invest. Now, this is where the fan base comes into play. This has never been a problem at Texas, but especially in the NIL era, you want to flex about how you're going to dominate this era because the rules of the game or lack thereof are heavily tilted in your favor. You're right, but that doesn't matter if you don't invest. But they have invested and invested and invested and invested. And so, you know, they sell out that stadium. They invest. Uh, those are some of the ingredients that if you fulfill them, make me not really care if you got high expectations. Because if you've done everything that they're asking you to do on your end, it's reasonable to have high expectations. And then the last thing they had to do is they had to go recruit. I've talked many times to you about one of the biggest myths, one of the biggest lies that I thought was being told about Texas over the last decade plus is, well, Texas has always recruited elite players. Texas has always had great recruiting classes. It's a lie. They were lying to you when they told you that. Texas recruited a whole bunch of ornaments and they forsook the tree itself. It doesn't matter if I go out and sign 25 four and five star receivers. I will finish with the number one recruiting class in the country. I will be boat raced every Saturday because I did not build a football team. I just built a really shiny looking recruiting class. Uh, Texas had not recruited from the inside out the way they needed to, to win in the big 12, much less in the sec. Now they do. And that's why the other day when we were looking at, you know, returning starters and we were asking about Texas, how they're going to be here, how they're going to be there. Doesn't matter if you don't know the names, same thing we just said about Georgia a little while ago, just cause you don't know the names, even if you may be a bulldog or a longhorn fan coming in the spring doesn't mean you won't be swearing by them come October and November because the caliber of athlete that is walking through the door in Austin, Texas is just a little bit different and maybe earns the benefit of the doubt a little bit more than guys elsewhere. The last box they have to check is win yourself a national championship. Got to the playoff last year, uh, did not get it done against Washington. It's okay. Sark's not 75 years old. He's got several more cracks at this. If they keep things on the tracks out there, several more tracks. It's the classic cannot versus have not thing, which I know you get tired of, but every show has a bunch of new viewers. So what I mean by that is 
there are a lot of coaches out there who have not won titles yet, who people mistakenly look at and say they cannot win a title. They did it with Kirby for a little while. They don't do that so much anymore. Uh, they're doing it with Sark now. Remains to be seen whether they'll continue to do it. But I believe he's got everything in place out there he needs. And just make sure you're in position every year to take a crack at it. And they will be for the foreseeable future. If those things continue to hum like they have, they'll be in place. And it's perfectly reasonable for a Texas fan to be walking into every season saying, you know, if we don't go deep in this playoff, if, if we're not there in the national championship picture, I kind of feel like this season's been a failure. That's harsh. That's a steep standard. But you've met your end, so they should meet their end. i got no problem with that. Our buddies at FanDuel, as I told you earlier, have the odds out. Texas to make the playoff. If you want to bet it right now, you can do that. NCAA tournament is in the thick of things on the men's and women's side. You want to go lay five or ten bucks down, be my guest. But the college futures market is what we've talked about a lot on this show. And we exclusively have an odds provider that powers us with all of that and much more coming this fall. And we appreciate them always being on board. So, like I said, I know some of you don't wager. And if you're on the fence about it, I'm not sitting here encouraging you to do it. I would tell you, go over there and just look. Just look around. I remember vividly, back in the day, after we would go eat, you know, me and my parents would go eat when I was a kid, we would just go ride around car lots. I knew we weren't buying anything that night. We were just looking around. And unlike some people who look around, we were never going to be converted to buyers. We were just there to look around. I wonder what cars look like these days. Uh, you can do that with odds. Uh, some of you are fascinated by the odds making process and never intend to bet. Others bet every dime you have. I don't encourage it, but some of you do. Whatever. FanDuel, if you're going to do it, is the place to go. The place for us to go today was Columbia, South Carolina. And they welcomed us with open arms. We've been here all day. Look at, look at the signage behind me. Evidence. Evidence. It's not AI. It's not Photoshop. And uh, so they've been great to us. South Carolina is always great to us. Shane Beamer was great with us today. Sat down for a, a solid 40 minutes and could have gone for two hours with the guy. I think a lot of you know Shane Beamer from a distance. My goal for this is know him a lot better by the time you finish watching this show tonight. So without further ado, here is South Carolina head coach Shane Beamer. So we're a few years in now to the Shane Beamer era in South Carolina. Uh, fan bases always want things to be linear. Mm -hmm. You win six games, then you win eight games, then you win ten games. Uh, real world's not always like that. So where is South Carolina football as a program right now as we enter 2024? Yeah, I think we're on track. Obviously, last season, record-wise, wasn't what we wanted, but I don't feel like um, uh, I feel like we're, we, we've we took a step and we're in a better position now than what we were a year ago. Obviously, to go from two wins to, to seven wins with a bowl game in our first season uh, was great. And then we took another step the next year going from seven to eight. And then, you know, 2023 was not what we wanted record wise. But um, I, like I said, we're, we're in a better place right now because of, you know, the people that we have in the program, the young guys we brought in transfers and like where we are. And, and certainly, uh, again, five and seven wasn't what we're about and no one's happy about that. But it's uh, that's behind us and, and moving forward and couldn't be more excited about the future. When you go back and you assess well, let me scratch that because I know you're assessing week to week. You don't right. wait till the end of the year to do that. But right. when you get to the end of the year and you get to do a holistic review on a season, okay, you look at five and seven, that wasn't what we wanted. But that's just wins and losses mm -hmm. from the product and the process that produced it. How often can you look at one or two things and say, that's why we got this? Or is it maybe a cumulative effect of a whole bunch of things? I think it's a little bit of both, in all honesty. And it is something that throughout the season you're, you're, you're thinking about each week and, and you're looking at a big picture thing. And there was a time last year where we were sitting there at two and six. And at that point, you really start taking a look at what we're doing and, and uh, how we can be better and what the issues are. And, you know, a lot of it is, is off the field. We had 12 season ending injuries last year six on the offensive line so from a medical standpoint from a weight room standpoint from a nutrition standpoint looking at okay why did we have so many injuries but specifically why did we have so many at one position the offensive line so as soon as the season was over sat down with the strength coaches and the training staff and we literally went through every single injury that we had last season you know, why did it happen? When did it happen? How did it happen? Were, were there patterns or signs leading up to that injury that we weren't aware of? Or maybe is there something that we see now that there was a, there was a sign? 
Um, so that's one thing. But then obviously the the football part of it. We played five true freshmen last or started five true freshmen last season. Okay, so you're looking at it, me as a head coach, how can we better prepare these freshmen to be even more prepared to play if they get thrown into that situation? And then the schematic part of it, we uh, um, you know, we went through a stretch three if you take the last three seasons since we've been here, we've led the SEC in takeaways, if you take defensively, over the last three years. But there was a three or four game stretch last season, mid-season, where we didn't create a takeaway on defense. We didn't get one turnover. It's hard to win that way, especially in the SEC. So just things like that that you look at. So yeah, it's, it's everything, and it's how can we adjust? How can we be better? There were some things. I mean, we do that after every season. There were some things after 2022 that weren't good enough that we improved in 2023. Uh, so every year you look, you look at it, and, and how can we be better in the next season? And, and that's certainly what we did in this instance. One of the things that fascinates me that maybe no one else cares about, but I don't care because it fascinates me, is when you get to the end of a season, let's say you had a, a chronic injury problem. Mm -hmm. uh, fans notice that too. And so fans will always be quick to go to the call-in radio show or go to the message board and say everything from we need a new cleat provider to we got to alter strength and conditioning. And they, right. they can't really know because they're on the outside. Right. You're on the inside, but sometimes you may not have a background in sports science. You may not know exactly what a knee is made yeah. of, but you got to make the decision at the end of the day. So what is that information gathering process like? Like how sold or convinced do you have to be that this can be attributed to this before you say, all right, change it all? Yeah, no, it's a great question. And the thing for me is, is everyone, I mean, it's just society right now in general, it's very much a, uh, what's most recent? What have you done for me lately? And last season was not good enough. And it's easy to say, well, this is terrible, this is terrible, replace this, replace that. Well, it's the same strength and conditioning program that we had when we went from two wins to seven wins and then went from seven to eight and, and had the big wins that we've had in the, in, in, in the previous two years. It's the same people from that standpoint. And don't get me wrong, we're trying to get better. It was a big point of emphasis for us after 2022. Okay, guys, we won seven, then we won eight. Uh, we beat our rival for the first time in a while. We beat Texas A&M for the first time ever. We were nationally ranked. How are we gonna be better in 2023? Like nobody's sitting here patting ourselves on the back. So that was a point of emphasis last year. So for me, it was very much, okay, Shane, let's look at the big picture, the last three seasons. And obviously the most recent season wasn't good enough, but let's look at the big picture of what we've done. And for me, it's, it's talking to a lot of people. I'm probably um, too slow at times. I'm, I'm very thorough when, I come, when it comes to making a decision, whether it be a staff member or whatever we're doing in the program and want to hear different ideas. And I talk to our players. I mean, at the end of the season, I really wanted to get their thoughts on stuff and uh, essentially just had them kind of give me feedback on every single area of the program. And uh, kind of like you, a lot of stuff is in the news about the NFL PA surveys on all the NFL teams. And we did something similar even before that. Just I wanted to hear their thoughts on what we're doing in nutrition, on what we're doing on team travel the day before the game, our schedule, uh, coaching, the weight room, training room, equipment room, just you know, areas of concern, things that we can be better at. So gra gathered all their thoughts and then kind of sit back and look at the big picture and say, okay, what do we need to do to be better going forward? And sometimes that's making a change, which we did in some instances. And sometimes that's continuing to do what we've been doing, but let's find a way to be even better. And there was a lot of soul searching throughout our building and all departments this year about, you know, okay, we weren't good enough. And uh, we've kind of made a, talked about it as a team this year that everything that we do this season, like it's personal, you know, it, it's personal accountability. I was looking at the schedule a little while ago. It looks a little different because you don't have teams you normally play. You do have some teams that you don't normally play. Then you got Texas and OU that come into the conference. Uh, one of my favorite things being able to cover just ball in the SEC in general is seeing what it's like going on the road mm -hmm. and seeing how hostile and, and sometimes how um, how unaccommodating road venues are, how small those locker rooms are, and how big your travel party is. Yeah. Explain to folks who never get to see from your vantage point what it's like you walk into like Jordan Hare Stadium or you walk into Neyland Stadium. Some of those road conditions are so decrepit and it looks like from the, from the 1460s like gladiators <laughs> once upon a time could have walked that hall. But yeah, I wouldn't change it because I love it. Oh, yeah. and, and yet you take true freshmen on the road every year and yeah. they experience that for the first time. What's that like? It's, uh, no, it's a challenge. 
<laughs> it's a challenge. It's a great point, and it's so true. You know, you go some places where uh, the 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 environment, locker room, and all that is is decent, and then you go some places <laughs> where you know we had a game this past season where I had a coach at another SEC school call me and say, hey, just to give you a heads up, it probably wouldn't be a bad idea to invest in Porta Johns mm-hmm. because there's not going to be enough working toilets in this locker room and your players are going to be waiting to use the one stall that they have Community in the locker stall, room. Yeah. And, that's, that's, yeah. and that's not just the players, that's players, coaches, staff as well. I'm like, Porta John, like <laughs> the things you don't think about as a head coach, you know. So I go to our ops guy. Hey, we may need to get some Porta Johns for this trip as well because there's not enough bathrooms. Or it's funny you go a lot of these places. It's it's interesting how often the hot water doesn't work um, in the in the locker room after a game and things like that. But I love it. I mean, that's what being a competitor is about. So we we try and. You know, educate our guys a little bit beforehand so they don't get out there on Friday or Saturday when they see the stadium for the first time and lose their minds. You know, you try to educate them a little bit on what the environment's going to be like. Okay, here's the locker room and here's this and that. And uh, but it is something that that is is part of it. And you know, coaches say that doesn't matter, and and, and it doesn't at the end of the day. But you're talking about 18, 19, 20 year old guys that. And they walk in the locker room and there's only one bathroom, uh, one <laughs> stall that can affect them as well. So having those conversations. But it's not just that. It's, you know, the hotel. And you go some places. Yeah, there's great places. And you go some other college towns where um, the the environment's not ideal at the hotel you're staying at or whatnot. But, you know, we try and do a great job and make it as smooth as our guys. But that's one of the things that you love. You know, we went out to uh, Columbia, or Missouri my first year. And they were working on the runway there in Columbia, Missouri. So we had to land in St. Louis and bus from St. Louis to Columbia, Missouri and back. And we kind of prided ourselves on being road warriors. That was the theme that we, now it didn't work because we lost the game, but <laughs> trying to sell, that's the edge that we have. And hey, they're going to try and make it as bad on you as possible or bad for you and uncomfortable as possible. But we love being uncomfortable and this is what we're built for. The whole ops side of football yeah. that you would see if you were a fly on the wall in a staff meeting of yours. Yeah. It's really incredible. Do me a favor, whether it be a game week or whether it be getting ready for a spring practice, mm-hmm. the level of detail that you want to have at your fingertips as a head coach where nothing's left to chance. Like, Give folks an example of how deep that goes and the things that may be covered in a meeting mm-hmm. that would make people go, wow, like they're paying attention to that? Yeah. Um, a lot, you know, uh, specifically right now with spring practice, it's just, you know, putting together a practice schedule is something that I do myself, but then not just, not just, okay, what we're doing, but who's doing what, the field locations. So like for us on, on the practice field, their specific field locations, you know, the field, we have two practice fields out there, which field that we're on, which end of the field that we're on, or is the offense, when we go to this period and the horn blows, is the offense going in, is the offense coming out, is it on the 32 yard line or the 36 yard line? So those are all things that I as the head coach put together and then I'm thinking about things, okay, we've been in this area of the field, we don't want to kill the grass because we've been there, we need to make sure we just kind of rotate around uh, a lot of periods, you guys, you know that there's a lot of periods in practice. Okay, it's a 10 minute period, and if you're the running back, you're going to start out at this drill, but then you're going to rotate halfway through to this drill, just the organization. So I spent a lot of time on that and, and try and take pride in the detail. We had a couple mishaps today, so I didn't do a good enough job, you know, where we had some coaches that, that got to the wrong spot. But I probably, I learned a lot of things from, um, Kirby Smart, when I worked for him his first two years at Georgia, and uh, that was one of the things, just the, the, the structure of practice and being able to maximize reps with everyone where no one's standing around, always, do, always doing something, but then also uh, the level of detail when it comes to to travel, you know, my time with with Kirby at Georgia was the first time that we ever okay. You're getting ready to play a game. Here's who the officials are in the game, and uh, Josh has called more pass interference call penalties than any other official in the league this year. Or last week they had the Auburn. Samford game and this umpire he called six holding penalties you know the level of detail with that uh, we do it here but after every away game we'd come in and and we would talk about 
any issues at the hotel because you're you're going back to that same hotel probably two years later uh or maybe not now with the sec schedules but you're going back at some point so if we didn't like this setup in the hotel um let's talk about it and address it so all kinds of things um you could go on and on about the detail from an operation standpoint thank god we have a great one here in george Wynn that is a pro but those uh those ops guys are they, they have a lot on their plate I would say most folks in your profession aspire to be a head coach. Mm -hmm. Not all of them, but most want to get there. And they grow up playing ball in most cases, then coaching ball, and they work up to where they have their own room, and then maybe they're a coordinator. And then if they get to the level of head coach, sometimes and more and more lately, you find that some of the last things that you get to focus on are football. You got a whole bunch of non-football things. Paycheck's much bigger, and that's a huge blessing, but with that comes a whole bunch of stuff that has nothing to do with football. Yeah. Um, I would argue probably that's more so the case now than ever. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you've been a head coach that I would, I would still classify as a fairly new head coach, mm -hmm. but you've come along in that age yeah. where it was probably evolving and like ramping up more so than it ever has been. So uh, number one, do guys reach out to you for advice on that when they are new head coaches? And number two, like how much has that shifted over the last few years for you? Yeah, it has. Certainly, uh, you know, younger guys get head jobs and, and some have reached out to me just because it's was three years ago or four years ago, December 2020, when I got hired. And there were coaches that I reached out to then to pick their brains on stuff, still do. And then that's happened with me as well, guys that, that get it. I think it's evolved a lot. Um, you know, I grew up obviously the son of the head coach. So I saw that. I had a front row seat to it my entire life. But until you're in that chair, you really don't know. And I knew my dad had a lot of things that took him away from coaching and there was a lot of things that the job entailed. But until you're actually in that chair, you don't realize how much of your job is not coaching on the field. And it's why you hear head coaches that have gone from head coach to assistant and they're like, you know, I miss being the head coach certain aspects of it but man it's so great just being able to coach again and have my own meeting room and and be, be about football and, and recruiting only and i love all the different parts of the job but it certainly has evolved more than ever before where you know my dad was would do spring practice and then in the month of may he would go out and speak to hokey clubs raising money for fundraising well I do that and I go out and do that in the month of May and even some in April Gamecock clubs. But I'm also two, like two weeks ago on a Tuesday night, we had football workouts throughout the day. And then I got on a plane and I flew to Dallas, Texas for an NIL dinner just to have dinner with some donors out there out in Dallas, Texas. Went out there, flew out there, had dinner, ate, came right back, got back about one o'clock in the morning. I was back in here early the next morning going again. So there's things like that, that the job has certainly changed. And then with college athletics has changed. But with college athletics changing, then everything that the head coaching job entails has just continued to expand to so much more as well. And it's there's no there's no like guidebook. I can't pick up the phone and call my dad and be like, hey, how did you handle this from an NIL standpoint? Or how did you handle the transfer portal when you could have a guy that could transfer twice in one year if he wanted to? You know, we're all kind of learning and going through it the first time and unfortunately I'm in a conference with a lot of hot, great great head coaches and and you know we all realize the chairs that we sit in and there's great camaraderie with one another being able to reach out to one another and help each other with ideas and things like that I want to talk about the private jet life for a second because the private jet life most people aspire to get to, but they never get there. How crazy is it? You can be in Dallas, Texas, and you know that you could look at your watch and, and think, all right, if we got out of here right now, I could be in bed in Columbia in an hour 50, maybe two hours. Mm -hmm. Whereas the rest of us understand what the letters TSA mean and understand <laughs> what waiting in a terminal means. Like, how nice is it to get to that level where you just, you just kind of hop around? Well, that's great. There's still a whole lot of TSA pre-check and fine commercial for me, too. Like, I haven't been doing this that long <laughs> as well. So my wife and I went somewhere for spring break a couple weeks ago, and we were flying Delta and sitting in the terminal and all that also. Way to go, man. Yeah, exactly. One so of us. One of us. Yeah, exactly. And when I get zone one on that boarding pass, like, that is a win. Yeah. That has not changed. And I'll never forget my roots. So I, uh, I uh, uh, still doing that regularly, but fortunately with that trip or recruiting trips, being able to, to do that is, is just 
it's great. It's like you said, you know, um, being able to leave Dallas, Texas at late at night after dinner and fly back, but get back to your own bed and then be back in here the next morning. It's great from an efficiency standpoint and fortunate that on that trip, we had a great donor that allowed us to use this plane to go out there to, to Dallas. And then if it's school related business or recruiting, fortunate that we have, you know, multiple planes here at our disposal here at this university to be able to to use them, whether it be myself or Lamont, our men's basketball coach or Don Staley, being able to utilize that for recruiting also just from an efficiency standpoint. You mentioned two other coaches there that are having big success at this mm -hmm. university right now. And I mean, a lot of folks in the SEC care about football, football, football. And yet, you know, when we walk into these buildings, you can clearly tell there is an athletics culture. Mm -hmm. And the more success, more programs are having, obviously, the more it bolsters that culture. Yeah. I mean, number one, like how competitive is it between the programs here? And number two, how much is that self-fulfillment? How much does that kind of breed a culture in a building? Yeah, it's huge. It starts with our athletic director, Ray Tanner, who won two national championships as the baseball coach here. So I've got a boss that has sat in my chair and has won national championships and, um, and is a, is a, you know, you have a lot of athletic directors that haven't coached before nowadays, you know, the days of Frank Boyles and Doug Dickey and people like that are, are, are kind of gone past. Here's a former coach as well. So that's great to have him as a resource, but then to be able to have, you know, the greatest bas women's basketball coach in the world here on campus that I can reach out to and pick her brain on stuff is awesome. And to be able to go, and it's one thing I love about a college campus is just being able to be around other great coaches as well. So I love um, when I'm able to, to go watch Don's teams practice or Lamont Paris and our men's basketball coach, uh, being able to go watch his team practice and pick his brain. And, and you know, the rosters are different. They don't have 120 players on their team like, like we do in football, but a lot of the issues are the same. And being able to help each other with recruiting where you know we've had football recruits that have come through here hey what do you want to do this weekend can i meet don staley <laughs> and she's awesome she's never said no and uh, uh same thing with a player that she had last year that she was recruiting that me and don me and uh, lamont and i met with as well along with some of the other coaches and and uh, whatnot so it's a great community here like i said it starts at the top with coach tanner but to be able to um have great coaches that I can pick their brain on, but then also to be able to say, we've won national championships here at South Carolina. We're doing it in women's basketball currently. We're, we've done it in baseball, we've done it in other sports, and, and we, there's no reason why we can't do it in football. And certainly, I don't know if pressure's the word, but as a competitor, yeah, absolutely. You want, um, uh, I know how amazing this fan base is, and I see how they support all of our sports, and you wanna be able to bring them a champion. When you're filling spots on your staff and you guys just brought some new coaches in i've always sort of leaned towards the total games coach the experience factor yeah uh, because i don't get to sit in an office with those guys i don't get them for six hours like you do so from the outside that's always been a metric that i kind of trust um how much how much emphasis do you place on that and then above and beyond that like what goes into the critical factors you define when you're filling out your staff yeah i think every situation uh is different for that particular instance what are you looking for what does your team need um uh, what are you if you have a receiver's job open what do your receivers need at that moment tight ends whatever it might be uh without a doubt i'll We've certainly gotten more experience with our hires this year. I mean, being able to bring in Joe DeCamillis to coach our special teams, who's a longtime NFL coach that's coached in multiple Super Bowls, and to bring in Markwell Blackwell to coach the running backs, who's been a coordinator in college. Um, uh, Sean Elliott, who was a head coach in, in college. Mike Furry, who played in the NFL, coached in the NFL, and was a head coach in college. Uh, love that aspect of it and they're still young they're energetic and and they're they're hungry and that's where I think we we hit a goal line and that we were able to bring in guys that have great experience and have, have accomplished a lot 
but they're still really, really hungry and they have that edge about themselves uh, about being here, which I love. And um, it certainly helps in the offensive staff room. You know, we brought in Dow Loggins as our offensive coordinator two years ago. And he came into, I don't want to say a tough situation, but he came into a situation where normally if you're a coordinator coming in, you bring someone with you, either maybe your offensive line coach or your tight ends coach. And he didn't bring anybody in with him as far as on the field coaches because I like the group that we had last year. And then we had some movement on that side of the ball after this past season. So this was a one where Dow obviously was involved in the interview process with those guys and has ownership on who we brought in. And there's an unbelievable working dynamic in there right now with the offensive staff and the defensive staff and the staff in general, just because of that maturity and professionalism that we have with these guys. And then as far as critical factors, just one, you know, I mean, guys, that are good people first and foremost this profession's hard enough i don't want to bring a a butthole into this building that nobody wants to be around and you know we have core values that we live by in this program and making sure that those are the kind of those are guys that that embody what we want to be about what i want this program to be about and uh are on board with what we're about as well and uh then you get in there and you just have a chance to visit with people and and uh, found, you know, with kind of what we needed on the offensive staff and at special teams. To me, these guys were all home run hires from that standpoint. I assume like most normal people in a competitive profession, you may have days where you're sitting at your desk and you go, like, what, what are we doing right now? Maybe as a program, maybe as a sport, you just, what are we doing right now? So it always helps to zoom out and just remember like what your why is yeah. and what motivates you. And some guys are listen to the noise, chip on their shoulder type guys. Other guys are process oriented. Mm -hmm. What's your source of fuel? Like what drives you in this profession? Yeah, first of all, it's still the players. Um, I love to compete and I love working with young people. So I, I truly, and I know every coach says about it, but I, says it, but I truly, truly, truly care about every single player in this program. And Lenora Sellers, who's one of our quarterbacks, he came to me last year and he's like, hey coach, do you like really know the name of every player in our program? I'm like, yeah. I'm like, you don't think I do? And he's like, well, I don't know if some coach, if some head coaches do, and I don't know if they do, I'm assuming they do, but do or don't, but absolutely do. And not just their name, but their background and their story and wanting to connect with them on a deep, deep level. Like I still, that is why I got into coaching and, and nothing has changed. And the opportunity to, to work with young people on the practice field and work with them on the game field and, and watch them come in as 17, 18 year old freshmen and graduate and have a chance to go on to the NFL, that's still what it's all about. And then for me, uh, and here in Columbia specifically, the, I know how we got the greatest fans in the entire world. And I know how much they want to um, have a, bring a championship here to Columbia. I was here as an assistant coach with Steve Spurrier when we, when we won the SEC East. And I can remember coming back from Gainesville, Florida and at whatever time in the middle of the night and the people that were in that stadium across the street to welcome the team back. And when we beat Clemson two years ago and we bust back from Clemson and we got here and there were thousands of people right outside these doors here when we got back to Columbia. Like we have a loyal, amazing, unbelievable fan base and that's what gets me out of bed each morning gets me coming into this facility ready to work the players and wanting and the coaches and staff I get to work with but then wanting to bring a championship to these fans because I know how much it would mean to them and and uh, you know still working every single day to do that to bring that championship to Columbia for them last time I was home I told my mom, hey, we're going out on the road. We're going to do this whole thing. And she said, hey, one thing I'd like you to ask somebody is, it, do they really need to be in the office that many hours every day? Do they really need to be getting in there at 6 a.m.? and leave? What time you leave today? Uh, today, I've got a dinner with a donor to so try and work. raise some money. We'll so count that. Tonight, I'll get out of here about 545 because I've got dinner with a donor. Okay, so uh, Trisha Pate from Fortune, Georgia would like to know, do you really <laughs> need to be in the office this many hours? Like, what's happening during the day? Uh, it's all structured and regimented and organized so yes i would say we do um now, i'm not one of those guys that wants 
to say, okay, you got to guard your desk and you got to be there because I've worked for those guys where, you know, you got nothing going on and you're ready to leave, but you're kind of <laughs> looking around the corner like, is he gone yet? Is he gone yet? I don't want our coaches to feel that way. I mean, I try and be very efficient. Um, and I, and it goes back to, like I tell our coaches, I, I want them, um, I don't want them to miss a kid's sporting event and things like that. You only get one chance to be a, a dad. And we've got coaches that have a lot of young kids on their staff, on, on, on our staff that have young kids and want them to be a part of that. So we try and be very efficient with our time, but between uh, coaching, recruiting, developing relationships with our players, there's, uh, there's a lot, but we also try and find that balance as well. Like you can't just grind, grind, grind 24, seven, 365, because you're going to wear out. And I believe in being able to get out of the stack, get out of the office and, and being able to, to go do things and get away, th- get away from things for a little bit as well. Our players, coaches, and staff. So we're here when we need to be here. Uh, we try and be very efficient about getting our work done, but also having uh, time to be around our families and, and get away from football as well. What did you think when you heard the news about Nick Saban retiring? I was shocked. Um, it's one of those, you always remember where you were at that moment. My wife and I were in Asheville, North Carolina, and we, um, I was shocked because we had literally just had a SEC head coach's Zoom literally that day. And I think it started at 11 a.m., and we were off the Zoom at like 12, 15 that afternoon. And it was what, four out, less than four hours later, I think, that that news came out. Uh, so my wife, you know, she, I still remember we went to an Atlanta Braves game two summers ago and we were driving from the Atlanta Braves game and she tells me that Texas and Oklahoma are coming in the <laughs> SEC. And I'm like, <laughs> so no, I'm like what are you reading? Like, you need to get off the internet, uh, get off your phone. And then she told me that as well. She was on her phone and she's like, Coach Saban's retiring. I'm like, stop. We just had that Zoom. So I was shocked from that standpoint because it wasn't like he was on the Zoom and he was active on it. It wasn't like he was sitting here like I'm about to announce my retirement in four hours. Like he was very outspoken on it. Um, So initially shocked. But then after that, I don't know if sadness is the word, but um, disappointment that happy for him disappointment selfishly that he wasn't going to be a part of our game anymore because of what he's meant to college football and i mean i i can't lie I mean, it was still last time we had an in-person sec head coaches meeting with him in it was last may in destin and there's still a point of me i mean i'm still i'll be i'll be 47 at the end of march so i still feel like i'm young i mean there's still a part of me that i walk in a meeting and it's like that's Nick Saban uh, <laughs> as well. And he's a competitor and all that as well. But uh, there's great respect for him, for what he's accomplished, and, and being able to just listen to him in those head coaches' meetings and learn from him and learn from him and his insight. There was a little bit of sadness from my standpoint, but then happiness for, for him that, that, uh, uh, for all he had accomplished. And he felt like he was at a place where he could do that. There was, there's always this belief that, Head coaches must be privy to all this stuff. It's coming down the road. Like, mm-hmm. yeah, the public's taken aback by it, but head coaches, they surely would know about this stuff. And yet you mentioned Texas and OU, blindsided. Nothing. Saban retires, blindsided. Yeah. And there, there's got to be other announcements and rule changes that yeah. even catch you by surprise. Yeah. I mean, how frequent is that where something that's either in your world or may directly impact your job happens and you go, what? Yeah. I just found out from my wife. What? Yeah, exactly. No, those are two examples. And, and even with OU, like I had literally worked in Oklahoma the year before, <laughs> and nobody over there gave me a heads up. Not that the people over there needed to, but that was one that was interesting as well. I'd say quite a bit. I mean, there's a lot that that either my our athletic director, Coach Tanner, will give me a heads up on, hey, this could be coming down the pipe. Uh, or we're in an SEC meeting and Commissioner Sankey gives us a heads up on this may be trending in this direction. But there's a lot that happens that uh, I find out Sometimes I'll have someone in the media call me to ask me a question. I'm like, I should be asking you. You know more about this than I do. Someone called me last week about what are you hearing about? I know there's two ACC schools that are suing the ACC. And someone called me to ask me about that. And, uh, and I've told them, I'll find out my information reading what you write. So yeah. I don't know why you're asking me. But there's, uh, you know, it's one of those, I guess you're on a need to know basis. And when I need to know stuff, people will let me know. So if we're looking at South Carolina now, spring of 2024 is underway. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of people are focused on quarterback position. Uh, 
I'd like you to talk about that, but then extending beyond that, like what are the specific points of emphasis with this team this spring? Yeah. One, like a lot of teams in college football, we have so many new faces and every single year it's starting over, you know, like 2023 team. I think we had 40 new players on the team that weren't even there the year before when we accomplished, when we won eight games. And um, so it's it's one, how connected can we become and how quickly can we become really connected as a team uh, and get these new faces and new people, whether it be freshmen nowadays in college football or in high school. So many guys graduate high school early. So our entire freshman class is here right now, except for three scholarship guys um, from the state of Georgia that aren't here right now. But everybody else is here. So getting these acclim freshmen acclimated, new transfers coming in, that's kind of the main point of emphasis. And then because we have so many new faces, let's figure out, you know, kind of who we are as a team and, and what these guys uh, can be. We're fortunate in that we bring back a lot of leadership, a lot of guys that have played a lot of football around here. I mean, there's still a boatload of guys that were here when I got hired in December of 2020 that are still <laughs> on this team and um, that have been around here for a while now. And then a lot of guys that were a part of that first recruiting class that we brought in right after that as well. So we've got some a, a good combination, a good mix of veteran guys that have been around here for a while that are not happy about last season and are super hungry and super motivated. And then a good mix of new faces, talented, athletic new faces as well. So like where we are, there's a lot of competition out on the practice field right now. We have lost a lot of production, but we have brought in a lot of production from the transfer portal and high school recruiting. And I think our depth is better across the board. If you look at all of our positions, I really feel like we're, we're deeper from a depth standpoint than we were uh, than we were last season. And that's exciting. And let's kind of get out there and compete and figure out how this whole thing uh, uh, shakes out. It's a really weird situation now, just with rosters across the country, where there's not a whole lot of rules mm -hmm. on player movement and when players can move. It's just kind of, kind of free reign right now. Have you had to adjust anything about how much you check in on guys and make sure and take their temperature, especially in spring, because you got a, a post spring portal window coming up, making sure you good, you good, you good. I know you always would have done that. Mm -hmm. Is there maybe a little volume knob turn up now because you know the climate so unstable? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you're correct in saying that we've always done that. You know, I hear people say all the time, every year you got to like re-recruit your own team. You got to re-recruit your own team. And I get that, but I don't. I don't look at it that way. I mean, I'm a, I'm a relationship person and, and truly, like I said, care about all these guys and have relationships with them. So to me, it's just continuing to do what I've always done, what we've always done as far as building relationships. But I'm also naive, I would be naive if I didn't think there were people in their ear telling them, hey, you know, you'd be better off somewhere right. else. And these guys don't know how to use you. You'd be better off here. So I understand that that it's out there. We only have them in this building four hours a day and there's 20 hours a day that they're outside this building if they choose to be. Uh, so understanding the noise they're hearing when they're outside this building in regards uh, to that. So certainly the knobs are a little bit twisted and, and, and tighten them up as well uh, because it is, uh, it is different. There's no question about it. Um, but again, we want to just continue to, we're going to be who we are. We're not going to be fake by any stretch of the imagination. Be who, be who we are, coach these guys up, pour into them, make this a place that they don't want to leave. And if someone feels like they have a better situation elsewhere, wish them well. But I kind of always think back when I, there was one year I went and, and visited, the, uh, visited the Pittsburgh Steelers and Bruce Arians was the offensive coordinator at the time. We ended up going to the chart or the Bucks and won a Super Bowl in the Cardinals. And I went up there in in May for OTA's mini camp. And I can remember sitting in an offensive meeting that Coach Arians stood up in the front of the room. And here it is, like here, you're watching the Pittsburgh Steelers. And I remember him saying, "This ain't the Pittsburgh Steelers. This is just a bunch of dudes trying to make the team. <laughs> like the Pittsburgh Steelers, we'll know who the Steelers are." in September when we kick it off because that's the team when the team's going to be and it's not like that but I don't know truly who's going to be on our team until the middle of May because that's when the portal closes so I hope we don't lose anybody that's currently on our team last year we brought some guys in in the month of May that transferred from other schools so every coach in America truly does not know 
who is going to be on their team uh, until the middle of May. So in a lot of ways, it really hasn't changed how I do things, but you just also keep that in the back of your mind, too, that that uh, it makes the summer even more critical once you get those guys here because there's a short time frame to ramp up to the season. Last one here. You mentioned you won't really know what your crystallized team is until May. Uh, that's what a lot of coaches are saying. I don't know many of you guys who like it that way, but it is the way it is right now. Yet it's out of your control. You can't change the rule. Um, so as much as you try and stay focused on the task at hand and worry about things you can control, what is the thing out of your control that you spend the most time thinking about or checking on or reading about or being focused on? Mm, great question. Um, probably the thing that you say other coaches don't like and are concerned about the calendar and whatnot, the rules governing, governing college athletics, I guess in some ways it's under my, con it, it's, I have a say, but I'm not making the rules. Now we as coaches can help shape things and give direction, but that's people like way above our heads that are making rules. And that's probably something I've been to Washington DC twice now in the last year to go to Capitol Hill and meet with congressmen about What a headline by the way. What a headline. Yeah. Tell yourself ten years ago. Yeah, exactly. Be okay. That's another one my dad wasn't doing. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Um, but I was up there with Coach Staley for that one as well and 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 that's just one of those that you, you spend a lot of time up there and don't know how much we got done. So that's something that certainly I think a lot about, the calendar and how things can be better, and, and, and I want what's best for the game. But in the short term, there's not a whole lot I can do about that right now. So it's getting back to your focus on what you can control, and that's your team, our team here in this building as well. Um, but there is a lot of stuff going on out there in college athletics, but it just seems like it, it changes every week in regards to rules, calendar, when they can transfer, when they can't transfer, NIL, this has happened and that's happened, and this conference is doing this this school suing this conference I and mean, that's just a lot that that uh that uh is going on so stay you know tunnel vision on what you can control and that's right here now uh, so i'll get you out here on this part uh -huh. so you went up to capitol hill you're a guy who coaches in front of 80 to 100,000 people multiple saturdays in the fall you're a front-facing fixture of an sec program so you speak publicly you appear publicly a lot but then you go to capitol hill did, did the palms get a little sweaty? Like, how did you feel that day? What was the vibe on Capitol Hill? It was awesome. Like, I love, I love history. So being up there and being in the U.S. Capitol and, and the history in that building was awesome just because I'm a history buff and I love all of that. Uh, I probably, if I need to get my mind off football, I enjoy just keeping up with politics and things like that. So, yeah, it, it was pretty cool to be able to walk through those halls and, and see different people that are, you know, famous senators, congressmen, whatnot, and being able to meet with people and just the people in your own state, being able to meet with, you know, Tim Scott who ran for president or Lindsey Graham or or Jim Clyburn or Nancy Mace or whoever, all the different people from Russell Fry uh, and, and so many people from here in, in uh in uh, Jeff Duncan here in South Carolina, but then the other ones that you walk past, you know, you walk down the hall and you'd be like, oh, there's so-and-so's <laughs> office, you know, there's so-and-so's office as well. And then there was another trip that we took up there that was, you talk about Palm Sweaty, someone arranged like a private tour of the Pentagon while we were up there. So that was pretty awesome as well to be able to see the security level and everything in that also. But yeah, the palms are sweaty because you don't want to like, say something you know i'm up here for a reason i don't want to say anything that's going to screw this whole situation <laughs> up so just speak when spoken to and, and try and keep it keep it right there but everybody was just going back to coach staley everybody was enamored with coach staley i might as well not even have been there because <laughs> walking through the halls of the capitol everybody wanted to take a picture with her and things like that as well which was refreshing i don't think i've ever heard anyone say Sometimes I focus on politics to take my mind off <laughs> yeah. football. Like it's the first time I've ever had that one thrown at yeah. me. That's well, if I'm at home and I'm calling recruits and, and texting with them and, and I'm watching sports on television, which I always do, it's good every once in a while just to kind of see what's going on in the political world. <laughs> you quickly dive And then I listen and I say, you know what, I got it pretty good. <laughs> Coaching college athletics is not so bad. <laughs> Coach, we appreciate it. Oh, thank you. Appreciate that. Appreciate you guys being tuned in. We'll be back Thursday night, same time live, 8 Eastern, 7 Central. Until then, for the crew here, the crew in Fort Lauderdale, Coach Beamer, and everyone who's been great to us here at South Carolina today, I'm Josh Pate. Take care and God bless.